Hi, beautiful Hi, beautiful people. people. <laughs> Today we are talking to Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers. Did I said that right? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So would you tell the God is Great audience what you're about, credentials, etc.? Sure. So um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am a certified sex therapist. I was a professor in a marriage and family therapy program for 28 years. I now run um, an institute that trains therapists, physicians, clergy, pretty much healing professionals around sexual health. And then I wrote the book that we'll talk about today. Um, And that was really to deal with all the sexual shame that we have in the United States. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's been becoming worse and worse and worse over the last 40 years. Something very interesting that keeps coming up again and again is, you know, the church, and I don't mean to vilify the church all the time, but the church has, you know, traditionally propped itself up as this place to find um, your morality and a better sense of your sexuality because there's God and spirituality at the center of it. And they're, they keep talking about like a sex obsessed culture. But the irony is that in them trying to push sex away from us and this education away from us, they have in themselves become very sex obsessed. So it's like, no matter where you turn, whether it's your religious institution or your school or the Super Bowl, which is this huge controversy, you're seeing sex in a very limited, narrow-minded point of view. And it's all based on this obsession and this warped view of sexuality. The church, in other words, is not doing it any better than culture, quote unquote. No, well, and it's really uh, a, um ironic and ridiculous way of thinking that somehow you can withdraw all actual knowledge and somehow not, uh, and somehow know something in other words, we're not going to teach you anything. We're not going to learn anything about something, all the actual information, and somehow then know something. Because all we can then have is mythology. All we then, all we can have is fear, which is the problem. The church actually doesn't know what is true. All it then can have is fear because we've othered sexuality. We have made it something we actually know nothing about but it makes it really easy to control people. I mean, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I have a lot of conversations yeah. similar to this, especially around the facts of sex, sex education, that comprehensive sex ed delays sexual activity by about two years, mm-hmm. that empowering kids with information about sexuality actually yeah. helps them make more empowered wise decisions for their bodies that christians Mm -hmm. tend to not use birth control um or any protection from stds Mm -hmm. much like in less frequency than their peers because they're not being educated they're not prepared right when you provide comprehensive sex education when you raise a child to get age appropriate sex education which isn't we have to understand it's not sex education, when you're talking to a two-year-old, when you're helping them label their body, which is what's appropriate at two, three, and four, when they're five and they're curious about an other's body, you're helping them understand what's different, but you're also teaching them about friendship, and you're also teaching them about how to ask permission when you touch, you know, another person. Can you give them a hug or not? You know, you're teaching them all kinds of things about relationships. It's it's not just sex, right? You're teaching them all, all kinds of things that are age appropriate. When you do that in these small sound bites, as they grow up all the way through five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, they get involved with sex later, make safer sexual choices, have lower STI rates, lower teen pregnancy rates. They choose more compatible partners as they get older. They describe themselves as closer to their parents overall, all the way through their teen years, right? They're, the statistics are so phenomenal. And these are the things that parents actually want for their children. And as adults, they have more varied and more satisfying sexual relationships 
once they are partnered. This is what we want for our children, and yet we stay away from comprehensive sex education. It's just ridiculous. All of the Scandinavian countries have these results and have had them for the last 40 years or more, depending on when they started. Sweden started in 1945 with comprehensive sex education. Holland, Finland, um, Norway, Denmark, right? And we continue to stay away from comprehensive sex education, even though we have had this research for years. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> it really blows my mind. And I appreciate all of your knowledge and information on that. Um, but what I want to focus on is something that I very rarely see offered in books on sex education that I read or Christian relationship books that I read. The thing that's missing is the combination of the two, how sexuality and God are not meant to be mutually exclusive, that they right. can honor one another, that one is a reflection of the other. Um, so I wanted to ask, in your book, you mentioned joining the love of God with our experience of erotic human love. Would you say this is the mission of your work, or at least of this book? Well, I, that is what happened when I went looking. You know, I... Um, I asked a couple of key questions when I started doing the work. You know, I said, had, um, had Christianity always been sex negative? Um, and if it hadn't been always sex negative, when was there a time when it was sex positive? Mm. Well, it had always been sex negative. Oh. So then I said, well, on the Abrahamic line, had it ever been sex positive? And what I found was, yes, there was a time when it was sex positive. And actually for thousands of years, it was sex positive. And, and what I learned was that we have this, in the mon on the monotheistic tradition, we have this relentless God that has been trying to communicate that through sexuality, through a, a, a loving relationship, we are to understand something more about God's relentless love toward us. This is, we are in some ways limited in our experience here. This is where we are. So one of the places we can learn something more about God's love is through the loving human experience. And so there were all these examples I kept coming across where it was clear in, the, in these stories that God was using the human experience of deep love and deep loving touch to create this sort of biopsychosocial spiritual experience of love. And it just made sense over and over again. I love that so much. And I think the first, um, not rebuttal, but the first comment a Christian might have is, how can you say we're sex negative? Like we promote marriage as this beautiful union between man and wife. And, you know, how many sermons I've heard from some like young tattooed pastor that's like, you guys can't have sex yet, but when you do, it's going to be amazing. And like, you know, so they, I've heard it spun a lot. Like Christians are positive about sex, coming from a positive culture of sex. But my next question for, for you would be, in Christian culture and the traditional books that have been written on Christian sexuality and Christian relationships, what are the most, you know, glaring flaws you see in the way they're addressing their quote, sex positivity? Yeah, we have made it uh, patriarchal from the get go. So we built our sexual ethic out of a patriarchal, um, culture so we started our our sexual ethic the christian sexual ethic began out of the mind body split and the mind body split started about 300 bc with the um with the philosophers aristotle and plato that they were the first ones to split the mind and the body and say the mind is eternal ideas are eternal and the body, while beautiful, like we, we love all these beautiful bodies, especially the boy bodies, mm. right? We love these bodies, but they are temporal, right? 
And so we had a patriarchal culture. The men were the important ones. We, but the, we did this mind-body split, and that was culture as Jesus came along, okay? And then we have this brand new religion that is trying to get off the ground, and it is being kind of taken along by primarily, there were lots of women, a lot of women, in Jesus' ministry and in those first hundred years, but they started to get snuffed out by the men, and about 400, around 400, when Constantine was the ruler, he became a Christian. And he then had the power to start appointing who would be the leaders of the church. And they were all these men who were vying for the leadership positions. And at that particular time, what was happening in all of these competitions as to pick me, pick me, pick me, they were denying the body. And that became the sexual ethic. Who could deny the body the most? And so, and when they couldn't deny the body, they had women to blame. You mean denying the body as in fasting or abstaining from pleasure? Yeah, all kinds of ways in which the body had desires. Desires for food, desires for touch, desires for sleep, desires all the way around had human physical desires, right? So that was vilified just beginning with the like planted seeds of Aristotle, for example. And then you're saying Constantine was the one that took it further and said, one is greater than the other, one is more important than the other. Constantine appointed these Christians who were, well, I shouldn't say they were Christians, <laughs> yeah. the leaders, but yeah. they were saying what makes me more spiritual than all of these other people is that I'm denying the body more. I have more discipline. I'm more spiritual. And the way they were proving that was through the, the denial of the desires of the body. That was not part of Jesus' ministry. That was not something that Jesus said was important but by 400 a.d right they had these men had said this was what made you a better christian Mm. okay and that then cemented the beginning of the sexual ethic of christianity right and the men then started this sexual ethic and they um it started and then around the 11th century was when they kind of cemented it into the doctrine and cemented celibacy. Mm -hmm. And actually the men walked away from their marriages and left the women behind without money to quote unquote, raise their children in poverty. That happened around the 11th century. I mean, it it was really blasphemous that that all, it had nothing to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with Jesus' ministry at all. But that is our sexual ethic. And it is our sexual ethic to this day. And we still blame women for it, right? So when you look at our sexual ethic, this is what it still is. And so you talk about these men who say, oh, it's going to be so great when you get married. What they do all along is they, it's still, it's all about What is it all about? It's all about you're going to save yourself for what? For intercourse. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Intercourse is for who? Men. Men. And it's about the functioning of the penis. And it's about for the ejaculation of the penis. And she is taught it's for him. And she is taught her modesty is important. Mm Mm-hmm. And she's taught that she can unleash the dragon if she is not modest enough. And he is taught that his drive cannot be managed by himself, right? That he has to look to her to manage his drive. And she's also taught that she has to manage his drive. She can't trust her own self. She can't trust her own body she can't she's so afraid of her own pleasure because if she taps into her own pleasure it's scary 
right? If she gets to know her own pleasure, she's a slut, right? Yeah. And so what happens then is then you don't do anything. You shut down your sexuality in all ways, shape, or form, and then you get married. Then you get married, and then what happens? Then she turns over her sexuality to him. He believes he's entitled to it. And now they've gone from nothing, except for to feel shame and guilt, and now they get married. And he's like, okay, I'm entitled to this. And he now is basically asking for it. And she's basically giving it out of obligation. And now you have a transactional sexual relationship where there's no honest desire. Like, I really want to spend time with you. This feels so yummy and delicious. And yeah, yeah yum, yum, right? And he looks at her eyes and he's like, she's not really there. She's not really wanting to be here. She's giving this out of obligation. How soon is it before her desire is tanked? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what am I describing? Every traditional Christian marriage. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still focused or like stuck back in the beginning of this conversation because you know how every decade or, or, you know, certain period of time seems to swing from one to the other. Like you have the 1950s, like incredible repression of women desires. They're on quaaludes just to survive and get through another day. And then 1960s and 70s swings to sexual revolution and freedom. So then we have the purity movement in the 80s and everything swings back to the other side. Like, was there something going on in that time where those original founders of our shared faith felt like they had to push back against what was happening in the culture? Or was there rampant promiscuity or was there some sort of you know, hatred of the body or of pleasure beyond what was just on the surface of like, we're just going to take this up? Well, see, this is what lots of people think. When you take, when you fly up at 40,000 feet, what you find is there has always been over time something that scared the public. Yeah. That caused the people in power to do something then to grab hold of the fear that the public felt. There was a plague, there was a famine, there was a war, there was something scared the people, and then the people in power took that fear and used it to their benefit, whatever they needed, okay? So yeah. I did my adolescence in the 70s, okay? It was a great time. It was a fabulous time. It was a fabulous time to be a Christian. You know, it was the Jesus movement. You could be on drugs. You can be doing whatever. And people took care of each other. If you were in the secular movement, it was love the one you're with, right? Take care of each other. Yeah, there were a whole lot of people having sex with a whole lot of people, but they were taking care of each other. They were loving each other. A lot of older people didn't like that, but it was consensual. Well, and then, you know, you're talking about these moments that happen that shift everything and people in power yeah. take that. Obviously, in the 70s, 80s, we have AIDS. So what happened was AIDS, um, the um, reaction to second wave feminism, and there was an economic downturn. So those three things happened, and the people in power jumped on that. So there was a merging of church and state, okay? So no longer could Bob Jones University um, support segregation. The government wouldn't allow it anymore. And so no longer could they rally the Republican base behind the religious right any longer. They had to come up with another issue. The Southern Baptist Church had been behind abortion between 1974 and 1979. They no longer could, um, they had to come up with another issue. So what issue did they come up with in 1979? Abortion. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> they came up with abortion. Right. They had been behind it between 74 and 79. I know. I was there for it. I mean, it drives me crazy to imagine that anyone might be listening and think you are some crazy conspiracy theorist. I know. So here's it what sounds I say. conspiratorial. I know. But here's what I say to people. There are a lot of people who, who read Francis Schaeffer back in the 1970s and 80s. Francis Schaeffer, for a lot of people, and for me included, was this brilliant biblical scholar. I read a ton of his books. I loved his books, right? He also was behind a lot of this. His mm. son, Frank Schaefer, is a friend of mine and colleague and somebody I love and respect. He was in the middle of this in his 20s and 30s. When mm. he hit his 60s and was a grandfather, he felt so guilty for what he was involved in, in the religious right, that he wrote a book called Sex, Mom, and God. And he told the stories of all the meetings he was in, who was a part of those meetings, and if you really want to know what happened between 1980 and 2000, go read that book. I'm a fan of Dan Savage, which I feel like some people might think is controversial because, you know, he's Dan Savage. Oh. But anyway, I love him. And um, he was talking about, um, <laughs> it was like maybe off topic, but femdom, which is when yeah. people want to be dominated um, by having someone like financially destroy them. And they find an erotic charge in that. But what it brought up for him was he was questioning or he was bringing up the point that so many um, points of eroticism or fetish are actually aligned with what's going on in the culture at the time. So if we have a huge economic downturn, like in 2008, you know, he was asking, he was like, I wonder if this is when the femdom thing really started exploding because our attitudes towards sex and the way we act in the bedroom is very often a reflection of what's happening in culture as a whole, which is really fascinating. And which also just reiterates everything that you're bringing up right now, which is that they are going to constantly reflect one another. Right. And it does make sense because we are not compartmentalized people as desperate as religion has been to compartmentalize us into right. body and soul. We actually are always always you know reflecting everything we are one entity walking through the world yeah i love that we're talking about this because so many young christians and i would categorize myself this way a million times there's so much to learn but we just take for granted that things have always been a certain way and you know right. especially when i hear from a 16 year old arguing with me about homosexuality and they're like the bible doesn't change god is the same now today and forever and i'm like Okay, but like if you just peek back, you know, pull the curtain a tiny bit, you would be, you know, losing it, realizing how much we've been manipulated throughout time. And that is not to diminish the truth that God is unchanging and divine. It is just to say that when we're not careful and we don't do our due diligence and look at the issues that I just think, you know, if your cognitive dissonance is occurring within your body, if your body is screaming no to something that they're forcing down your throat, those are the like cues, which you talk about body cues a lot in your book. You listen to those cues and think, okay, I wonder if I can go deeper into this. I wonder if I've been taught something wrong. Right. And a lot of it does for me go back to the moment of the moral majority, you know, whispering in Reagan's ear in the 80s. A lot of our ideas about purity culture and modesty, abortion, et cetera, all, like you said, originated in that time. Right. And when you realize it's that, that recent, and then when you realize that there is a better pathway, that people have had better examples of sexuality for millennia and we don't have to just abide by this brand new ethic we were given like right. 40 years ago right and that can carve something brand new for us in our sexuality right and that nothing should make you inside yourself not feel beloved of god mm. and if it does make you feel anything other than beloved of god it just might not be from God. Amazing. I really, well, yeah, for definitely. <laughs> I just feel like that's so important for people to know. Like if it makes you feel shame, if it makes you feel unworthy, 
just know that it might not be from God because God never makes us feel unworthy of their love. Never, ever, 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 ever. I like that you said their love. That's a whole other story. If yeah, I know, but we won't mean. go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Go do your research, people, if you don't know what she means by that. Um, but yeah, let's dive into creating this new sexual ethic for people that have been trapped in this mentality for their whole lives, potentially. Um, so basically in your book, and please everyone go get a copy. It's incredible. It's Sex, God, and the Conservative Church, Erasing Shame from Sexual Intimacy. But you really talk about how in your research, you did realize that Christianity has always been sex negative due to really not the concepts that we were given from the divine creator, but from just men um, determining how we are going to view these things from their point of view. And what you did in the book is so beautiful, just going back to the Torah and to the Hebrew tradition and how they were viewing sexuality, sensuality, lovemaking. So for anyone that really is not everybody knows this, it's Christian, but the Torah is half of the Bible. It's the Old Testament. So we actually do have a lot of commonalities and stories and faith traditions that we share with Jewish people. Um, so what you've done is take the way they were viewing sexuality in the Hebrew tradition and combine it with the ethics displayed from Jesus. Mm -hmm. So can you just give us a little example of like how you see sexuality in the Old Testament and then how you brought it into the New Testament to apply to Christians? Right. So I'm, I'm in no way a biblical scholar. Um, I'm a pretty simple thinker, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus was a Jew. And, um, and so I just said, well on the Abrahamic line was, was sexuality viewed positive anywhere along the way. And because I said to my, so I'm Swedish and Swedes are really stubborn. So I kind of <laughs> said, if God is God and God made our bodies the way that they are, and we come out of the womb, as you so well know, um, and the milk doesn't come down, right? For two, three days. But mm -hmm. we immediately are seeking connection and pleasure, immediately, right? Right away, babies are rooting. Right away, they are turning with the smell, with the feel towards the body, towards the mother, right? Right away. We know that if toddlers are not, you know, little ones, the infants and toddlers, if they're not given enough loving touch, they will suffer neurological damage connection and pleasure. We know if you walk down the halls of an Alzheimer's unit, you cannot have memory and you will find people seeking connection and pleasure. It is hardwired into us as humans all around the globe, across time, across history. So it is who we are. Yeah. Can I also bring up something I've been telling people because it blew my mind about breastfeeding is that one, you it takes, um, what am I looking for? A release of oxytocin to go into labor. So that's why they say to have your partner stimulate your nipples or to have sex to release that oxytocin. So pleasure leads into pain, leads into the birth of new life. Right. Also during breastfeeding, I always thought the baby just like pulled on your nipple and pulled the milk, milk out. But actually they release oxytocin by flicking your nipple up and down with their tongue which brings you pleasure and then getting the milk, which I was like, when he first, my child first started doing that to me, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is what babies do. But then I remembered it's that release of oxytocin that brings him his food. And yeah. I was like, wow, the correlation between motherhood and sexual pleasure even, and all kinds of pleasure with the body, with yeah. our exchange mother to baby and partner to partner creating that bit it's all mixed together right exactly plato was one of the first to use the word eros and mm -hmm. eros means the beauty of body and soul right so we 
Eros, the core word of erotic, is the bringing together of beauty of body and soul. That's what erotic is. We have turned it into something that's dirty, but it's not. It is at the core the divine. The Hebrew people believe that when you kiss, you are exchanging the breath of God. They believe that when a baby is born and a baby takes his or her first breath, they are breathing in inspiration, the in-breath of God, the in-spirit of God, and that that is coursing through your body throughout your life. That is your inspiration, and that when you expire, you take your last breath. That is the breath of God leaving your body. One of the stories I came that's in the book, you know, is, has to do with desire. And the, at the core, they believe that all desire is the core of all creative desire. So they believe desire is good. All desires, sexual desire is good. And that you cannot, if you remove sexual desire, you remove all creative desire. Yeah. So they just believe your job is to manage it, that God gives this great gift to you, but you must manage it. There's a beautiful chapter in your book where you really lay out all of the different stories um, and examples in the Torah of sexuality and spirituality being completely aligned and God like manifesting his presence and his love through our bodies, through the experience of sexuality. And Again, I recommend everyone go buy this book and read those stories because it really validates biblically that we are not only worthy of pleasure and desire, but that there was nothing in that that God ever wanted to repress or to have anyone else repressed within us. But paired with that, what you're saying is simple that, you know, a lot of people will make the accusation if you are a Christian and you don't have these list of like 17 rules of do's and do nots, then you won't have any moral compass and you'll just be doing whatever you want. But the Torah, again, does not excuse people from personal responsibility. And it still definitely talks about the preciousness and the attentiveness and care that is required to enter into a sexual space with another human being. Sexual being everything from a hug to a hand holding all the way to penetration and everything in between, because we often also forget that there's an everything in between that's just as valid and just as sexual and beautiful. Right. And it's not just pre-committed relationship. It is all the time. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that is, is what you're doing serving connection and pleasure? Is it serving love? Is it serving justice? Is it serving mutuality? And it's not just your decision. It's your partner's decision too. Do they feel like you're treating them like the divine? Do they feel beloved in your arms? Right? And this is a negotiated thing. They are pregnant now. They are sick now. They, they don't feel like this thing now or that thing now, right? Yeah. Yes, and it is throughout these stories. You know, like there's one story, so people, well, I'll just talk about one. There was a first century priest, a rabbi, that once a year would pull aside the paraclete, which is that big heavy curtain that would separate the Holy of Holies from the, the, where the rest of the people would be would pull it aside so the people could see inside the Holy of Holies and would say to them, this is so you can know that God loves you like a lover and longs for you like a lover. And I, it just blew my mind because I thought, how would we think of our relationship with God differently if we understood that God loves us like a lover and longs for us like a lover, rather than just like a father, how would we think about ourselves different? How would we think about sexuality different? How would our relationship with God be different? Because we would be thinking about it like, you know, like these experiences we have in our life when we really feel seen, known, loved, accepted by a lover, rather than just by a parent, which is a very different experience. 
Yeah. One of the main differences uh, just coming up for me is that one, you get to choose and one you're just given. So a lot of people have warped relationships with father figures and they can see that figure as something very terrifying or a pushover or someone that works too hard or like, you know, you can't attribute your father's qualities to God and think that it's a perfect turnover. Whereas a lover, even if you have only had abusive, terrible relationships, I think you could still imagine what a true lover would be. There would be someone that knows you and delights in you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. I know. So, you know, that's one of just several. And, and when they didn't rebuild the, the temple again, the way what the Jewish people did is they said, now your bedroom is the holy of holies of your home. And when you make love, now you are to prepare yourself like the priest prepares to enter the holy of holies. You wash yourself. You prepare your mind, you prepare your heart, you prepare your body to receive each other with the same kind of intention that you would go to be with the Shekinah, to be with the feminine face of God, because what you are doing together is holy. And I will be there. I will be there to celebrate you. Like, this is how they thought. Like, wow, imagine that, that we actually thought we communed with God when we made love to each other. And so we prepared, like we prepared because we were going to make, like literally make more love for ourselves and make more love for the world. Like that's how we thought about making love. And we raised our children to think about it that way. Mm. So now it's like, girlfriend, you just don't make love with any old person because you want them to worship you and you want to be able to worship them so that you bring more love into your life. So honey, you're probably not going to be ready for that at 16. (laughs) Right. I mean, yeah, it's so ironic to think that most parents or a lot of parents, because, and I don't blame them. We've all had a piss poor sex education, the majority of us. So it seems like the right thing to do would be to say, you're 16, you're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. But in reality, if you'd instill these principles and these ideas about divinity and the true beauty of it, then people would make their own decisions based on that information and knowledge. Exactly. But still, I think it's really worth bringing this all down to earth because I love, I mean, I'm obsessed with it and I love it and it's so poetic, but then it's like, okay, so how does that translate into real life? Because there are a few different takes on it. Um, Perhaps maybe last we should dive into when someone is like violated because there has been a lot of confusion around that in church you know, especially if we talk about sex being this majestic, wonderful, you know, partnership between two people that worship God. It's like, where does it fall in when it's not consensual? Um, But before we get into that, let's talk about, you have a Christian couple come into your office that has been raised to believe that they are supposed to remain essentially asexual and, and, in every way, in thought, in body, no masturbation, no preparing between each other, no foreplay before marriage, no, you know, consideration of their own body, their own pleasure, etc. I feel like you must have a lot of people come in your office quite a hot mess with all of these issues. Yeah. And if you have this ethic that you see in, in the Hebrew culture that you've combined with Jesus's message, how do you even begin on that path? What does it look like to actually steer people from those puritanical ways of thinking about their sexuality into this ethic that actually celebrates their pleasure and their mutuality? Well, often they are filled with a lot of sexual shame. Right. And um, so I, I just so that you're... Um, viewers have an idea of what I mean by sexual shame. I'm, if it's okay, I'd like to read the definition of sexual shame. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, of course. Because sexual shame is something we feel in our bodies Mm. and it comes from being told it is not okay to feel your sexuality, 
to think about your sexuality or to act on your sexual desires in any way, shape, or form from the time they emerge until you are in some kind of what is considered biblically okay or what they, you've been told is okay. And so you try not to because you think you're not supposed to because you've been told you cannot not. Right. right. Which is actually impossible. It's like being told not to breathe. <laughs> yeah. You cannot act. Like, yes, you cannot act. But everything else is, in, is impossible if, unless you're asexual, naturally. So right. sexual shame is a visceral feeling of humiliation and disgust toward one's own body and identity as a sexual being and a belief of being abnormal and inferior and unworthy. Oy. This feeling can be internalized, but it also manifests in interpersonal relationships, having a negative impact on trust, communication, and physical and emotional intimacy. Sexual shame develops across the lifespan in interactions with interpersonal relationships, one's culture and society, and a subsequent critical self-appraisal. So it starts at a year old when you find your clitoris or your penis and you're getting your diapers changed and somebody slaps your hand away or says, don't, that's dirty. Mm. And then it happens again and again and again and again. And it starts this internal dialogue that starts when you can start language and you're like, I'm, I'm bad. I must be bad. And right. it happens over and over and over. So the critic, the inner critic gets going and then it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So it's a feedback loop, right? There is also a fear and uncertainty related to one's power or right to make decisions, including safety decisions related to sexual counter encounters, along with an internalized judgment toward one's own sexual desire. So it means then when you want to go out and do something, you're not even sure you have the right to ask for protection or that you can protect yourself. So you don't have voice for yourself. We've just set them up for failure. Yeah. Totally, totally, right? So there's there's so many things like that. So there's frame, there's name telling your story, there's claim claiming your body is good. They don't come into this thing feeling like their body is good. No. You don't feel like any of it is good. No. And then you have to do frame name and claim before you can aim for a different legacy. They don't even know that the legacy they've been handled handed is hurtful. Having said all that, I want to say that it's not abstinence that's the problem. There is absolutely nothing wrong with waiting until you get married to have sex, provided that you've done a bunch of sex education, provided it's your own decision, provided that you've learned about your body, provided yeah. you're having conversations, provided you're doing all kinds of other things that have to do with celebration of your body and sexuality. Right. Nothing wrong with that if it's yours, if you are doing it out of the expectation that everything about it, sexuality is bad and I'm doing this so I'm promised something, that is probably going to be hugely problematic. And I would walk into a Christian sex therapist's office who actually knows my work and prepare yourself for a good unfolding, mm. which is going to take at least six months to do. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. And I have so many personal stories and stories from friends, you know, all of the traps that we can fall into. One of my dear friends got married at 19 and was expected to go on the freeway immediately. And she wound up crying in the bathroom afterwards, feeling violated right. by her husband. Um, I know that, you know, in the me too era and everything that's coming out now so many myself and so many of my friends hadn't even realized moments that were inappropriate because again we were never taught that our bodies were beautiful that we were worthy that we were worthy of pleasure even even right. just thinking about the times where i just allowed something to not be that pleasurable and just be like okay well i guess this is fine you know right, of um but all the things that we never had a voice for. And right. I have one particular story that really makes me sad for her, the her being a former version of myself. 
where I was being really hurt in a sexual situation, but I immediately disassociated and went into, well, I deserve this. I'm being bad. I'm not married. This is what I deserve. This is punishment. So it's like, these are the layers that that kind of purity culture brings us. And I think there is still a huge school of thought. If it's not fully conscious, it's still there of those of us male and female who believe that if something bad happens to us or if we're not in pleasure or if we're not understanding the fullness of sexuality, it's simply because we didn't do things, quote, right. Like even people that are married might say, well, we should have saved the first kiss for our wedding. You know, it's just like I could have been better. I could have done better. And then God would be blessing my sex life. You're shaking your head no because. I I know because. (laughs) I, like you, have sat with so many people who, quote unquote, tried to do it all, and then they get married, and they're like, oh my gosh, we are struggling so much. We are struggling so much. How come we weren't given this promise that whatever? Mm -hmm. And then they either try to find that one thing they did wrong to justify why it's so hard, right? or, you know, they're just so incredibly disillusioned right because it was all a lie it was all a lie actually what you need like with so many things you need to be prepared Mm -hmm. and you need to see sexuality as a gift and a blessing you know and your body is a gift and a blessing and like all things it needs to come in time You know, God means for us to live an abundant life. And in order to live an abundant life, sexuality must unfold in time. So yes, we're not going to be ready in the current complex life we live. We're probably not going to be ready at 14. Probably not, right? But we might be ready for some relational kinds of things at 14, We might be ready for other relational things at 15. You can have some really lovely experiences at 16, but they are going to need to be in the context of loving kindness. So we need to raise our children to understand what loving kindness is, right? It's not going to happen probably in hookup culture. If you're allowing yourself to use people or to be used, it's going to feel yucky because we are not meant to use and be used. We are not. And so we've got to teach our children around these things, you know? It's common sense, but we've got to have complex, comprehensive conversations about how we treat people and about sexuality and sexual unfolding and relationship unfolding and conflict and consent and all kinds of things. Um, We just have to. Yeah. Um, The most abridged version of my story is like coming out of purity culture, trying to save myself from marriage, not fully succeeding. I think I lasted till 22. And, um, so then when my marriage didn't work out cause my husband was cheating, it was, you know, I could have done better. Maybe if I'd waited for actual marriage, you know, it would have worked out, et cetera. And I think people that give me dissenting comments still say that to me occasionally, like, well, no wonder your marriage didn't work. Like it, God wasn't blessing it because of your sexuality that you had with the person. Um, but then I went on what I call my tramp page after my marriage, which was swinging the pendulum all the way to the other side and deciding I'm going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't want anything to do with that sexual ethic I was given. I need to explore this on my own. And it's not until I have this bird's eye view of being in a very mutual, beautiful, edifying relationship with a partner that I... I'm becoming so much more conservative about sexuality. I'm not conservative in the actions. You know, I still obviously believe in kinks and expression and, you know, all kinds of very fun stuff, but more conservative in that, yeah, I want any sexual experience I have to be fully mutual. And I do want, you know, I harken back to Dan Savage again, but he's like, never let anyone leave your house like in shambles. Everyone needs to leave your house, your bedroom, 
better than you found them. And it's like, if that's a secular sexual ethic, then Christians should have a much higher sexual ethic than that. And much more, you know, spiritually oriented one. And it really does break my heart that we're missing this full gap in, in the Christian space. So it's like, how do we take these very beautiful stories from the Bible? How do we take Jesus's expression, how he walked through the world, how he would have never been disrespectful, how he was a feminist in the way he behaved with people? How do we take that and make it tangible if, you know, someone is having sex outside of marriage, for example, and maybe they have a loving relationship, but they're very conflicted with, am I sinning? Am I not sinning? Well, I, I do think we have to be brave enough to construct a sexual ethic that, it, that takes in con- into consideration some of the stories that are in the Hebrew text and some of what we know about how Jesus related to people. And this is what I propose in my book. Um, Jesus was very consistent in how he loved people. And if we, uh, so for example, um, in my book, I talk about the vow of Ona. The vow of Ona is a series of guidelines that are still taught today. They are taught in Jewish boys' schools. Um, You can apply them to your relationship. You can apply them to your dating life and you can apply them to how you parent your children. And they teach on consent, they teach on power, they teach on how you do sexuality in your relationship. Um, If you apply those to how you raise your children, how you do your relationship, how you do your uh, committed relationship, you have a lot right there. Now they are not like, don't do this behavior, right? But they are, how do you treat each other? Right. Yeah. So if you did that and you looked at how did Jesus love, how did he apply justice in his relationship? If you break those things down and you actually taught your children how to do those, like, did, what does it mean? Like, um, so how, like, this would be a conversation I remember having with my son when he had his first girlfriend. How do you know that she wants to kiss you? Mm. Girls will often go along with things. So this is about justice and this is about love. So how do you actually know? How do you go about finding out? You know, you want to kiss her, but how do you actually know? So this is about how do you do these things, right? Um, You know, so if you've got... um, uh, man is never, this is one of the vows of Ona. man is never to coerce or force his partner to be sexual through emotional or physical tactics. So what does it mean to actually teach your child that principle? What does it mean to teach that principle at 12, at 13, at 14, at 15? Or at 40, if he's a pastor using men submit or women submit to your husbands as a justification for us needing to always be sexually available. (laughs) Right. Well, and that's late. (laughs) But but I'm saying not too late, but yes, it's late. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm, but I'm saying, what does it mean to do these things? It's not don't have sex. Yeah. It's so much broader than that but it also is more respectful than that because it also leaves some choice and decision-making in the hands of the adolescent, of the young adult, because the reality for a parent is your child is out there making decisions anyway. Yeah. And if you aren't in respectful conversation with them, they're going to go underground and they're not going to talk to you. So what you want with them is you want them to be coming home and seeing you as a resource. So if you're just giving them dogmatic statements and telling them what to do, they're not going to see you as a resource anyway. So you want to be saying, so sweet pea, how are you going to do this? How are you going to exercise respect for someone, for your girlfriend, 
if she's likely to tell you what you want to hear. Well, and this too applies to assessing your own sexual ethic, you know, asking these questions of yourself because, you know, with God is Gray, my platform, I, I, I continue to reiterate that, yes, I have had a baby out of wedlock and I had a very promiscuous phase and I got a divorce and all of these things. I am by no means saying, you know, do what I did. This is a good idea. As a matter of fact, usually I'm saying the opposite. (laughs) Um, But that said, this channel is meant to be something that is based in reality, not in ideals and not in black and white. So our black and white ideal is that everyone wait until marriage. And for me, I even saw a rebuttal video to me having a baby out of wedlock and how it was a sin and a terrible idea for me to do so. And it was funny because I had to actually humble myself at certain points because I was like, well, he's right, you know, because he, I know I was like crying and or talking about how I cried when I found out I was pregnant and I wasn't sure if my partner was going to be there to raise a baby with me. And he was like, well, you should have gotten married. And I was like, he doesn't, he's not wrong. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, there's a reason that people like the black and whites. They like the structure of like, this is most likely going to work out because this is like a safer bet than the gray area and the confusing area. But the reality is the majority of Christians that I talk to that I've known in my life have not lived in those black and white spaces. They still will sleep with someone on a first date occasionally. They, you know, did get a divorce and now they're dating again and they don't know how to navigate. You know, it's not as easy as this. So then it's like, if your ideal is save yourself from marriage, that's one thing. But if you're having sex anyway, there's got to be a way that you're still honoring a Christ-like ethic and not just tumbleweeding and barreling around town, making messes of people's hearts, of their bodies, of their souls, and your own. Yes, absolutely. I had a conversation recently with someone um, choosing abstinence until marriage, which again, totally respect that decision. Um, but her view was that we know for a fact that Jesus never expressed himself through sexuality and that that made him sinless. And, you know, cause it kind of goes in a circle, this argument of like, well, he, if he was sinless, then he couldn't have been sexual. Then he couldn't have been sexual because he was sinless, you know, over and over again. So my question is diving into the history, and I already had an assumption about this. I know how sex negative the Christian church has been for so long, and I personally have not found evidence for a sexlessness in Jesus. Have you found evidence of this in the Bible to justify that idea? Well, first, I think that's funny. I think that whole thinking is funny because it's predicated on the idea that sex is sinful. Right, exactly. And I think sex may be, sex in the context of love may be one of the most holy human experiences we can have. Mm. Holy, worshipful. Because in the context of making love however we experience it we can be 95 years old and nothing is working in our body very well (laughs) but we are taking life on its own terms we know we don't have much time left and we are having a holy experience with another human because we know time is short Penises aren't working, vulvas aren't working, clitorises aren't working all that well, but skin is skin and love is love and this is precious, Mm. right? So there is alabaster oil and there is worship and there is love being made. There are tears flowing. That may be the most holy human experience we have. So you would be hard pressed to tell me that that is sin. Mm -hmm. I think it is the other end of the continuum. I have been with people 
I had a couple that I worked with and he was dying of a glioblastoma, which is the worst brain tumor you can have. Mm. And she climbed in bed with him one night when he went from being in a coma to coming out for three minutes for reasons we won't ever know. And she climbed in bed with him and he said to her, um, I want you to know how much I love you. And she said, how could I ever forget? And she took her nightgown off and climbed in just so they could be skin to skin and tears together. That was making love. That was holy moments. There didn't need to be genitals involved. That is holy. When the woman walked in to that, to that um, dinner party and let her hair down mm. and put broken alabaster jar over Jesus, she made love to him. And all of the disciples lost their shit. <laughs> and he and said as much to him. Yeah. And he turned to them and said, and what did you do? I tell you that what she is doing right now, this story will always be told. Beautiful. Jesus had no problems with bodies. He had no problems with making love when it was making love. It is the most holy human experience we can do when that's what it is. Now, can sex be the most hurtful thing we do to each other? Absolutely. Yeah, I did want to bring that up. So for anyone that's listening that has had traumatic sexual experiences, hearing it framed in such a spiritual way, I imagine could be incredibly triggering and painful to realize either someone, you know, tried to tried to use that for evil and yeah. attempted using that for evil. Yes. And yeah. that is truly the dichotomy of, of sex yes. that I don't think anything on the planet can hurt anyone more profoundly and deeply yes. or, you know, evolve heal. and edify and heal someone more profoundly and deeply. Right. Sexual assault will hurt you in your soul mm -hmm. as well as hurt your body sexual love can heal you in your soul as well and they are on full ends of the continuum right yeah so how do you help people address it when that has been experienced that kind of trauma if they have a truly loving partner we can work to heal them through sexual touch mm. and we we run retreats uh, in through our institute and we will work with that and we can work with it in therapy as well. Maybe I'd like to end on just, I get asked a lot about kinks yeah. and bondage practice and stuff like that. Um, could you take a second to comfort people who are in their own skin that do want to explore that in their lovemaking? Yeah, I would say take the time to understand how to remain safe in those things. Those are all fine things. People People's sexuality is way more varied than most people understand. Yeah. It's all fine. But make sure you understand how to be safe in those things um, and how to have safe words and all that kind of thing. Um, if you have a kink community in your community, um, get a hold of them. Go through their new members class so that you learn all the sort of ways to do safety. Um, if not, get a book on BDSM or kinks so that you learn about it. So just be literate. So then you can have really literate conversations with your partner or partners, whatever. Um, I think that's important. Actually, the kink community does consent way better, better than the vanilla co oh, yeah. community does. Yeah. But, um, but most people in the vanilla co community who are moving into the kink community again, bring their lack of knowledge into it. So take the time to get educated is yeah. the only thing I would say. 
Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I think almost that statement really sums up the entire conversation, which is to say the more structure you have, the more that you can create a sexual ethic that you find edifies your spiritual practice, that you feel honors your body, God, your partner's body, the more freedom you have in that. Christians yeah. talk so much about freedom, but then they'll write a list of 17 rules about their sexuality and be like, can't give them a BJ, can't do this, can't do that. And it's like, right. no, you're focusing on mutuality, respect, consent. Right. right. When you have those rules, quote unquote, then there is so much freedom to play within that, that spectrum of exploration and, and your spirituality. Right. Well, everyone, please go pick up Sex, God, and the Conservative Church. Where can everybody find you on social media? Where can they find your book? So my Instagram is at Dr. Tina Shameless Sex. And from there, you'll be able to find my, um, my website. You'll be able to find where the, where, the, um, where the Institute is. From there, you'll be able to branch out. The only thing you won't find there is there's a community-built website that's called thankgodforsex.org. And that's a really fun website to go to if you want to hear videos of people telling their story about how they healed from uh, conservative um, growing up or whatever to a point where they've been able to thank God for sex. And it's got lots of resources and that's kind of a fun thing. And we modeled that after Dan Savage and Terry Miller's um, It Gets Better project. And that's a fun oh, thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> there you go. That's something that's just out there. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much. We You're love so you welcome. all. Yeah. <laughs> God Great bless. Talking to you. Bye.